Thank you, guys. Uh, we praise God for uh, our brother Paul. After uh, a long, uh, long sessions here, uh, we hope that uh, we won't uh, exhaust him with our questions. But there are there are some. So, if in case uh, you wonder how long it's going to go, we try to uh, we'll try to go through them. I, I went through them already, but we'll try to see how quick we can go through some of them. Uh, probably we won't get to all of them. Just uh, wanted to give you a heads up on that. And it's not because. Uh, uh, your question might have been good. It's just that we're trying to keep them based on kind of the, the purpose of the seminars, the purpose of this weekend, and some of the things already we touched on. Uh, all the questions were really good, just in case you wonder, was mine not good? It was. It's just that I tried to keep a theme here going. Um, so please uh, forgive us if uh, it doesn't, we don't get to your question. It's not because we have a specific uh, uh, a specific uh, plan or, or we know who uh, wrote this question. So, uh, by the way, uh, the questions are anonymous, uh, most of them. Uh, so, uh, so we are going to answer them based on that. So thank you for your patience. So we'll try to uh, still leave you, uh, let you guys leave uh, around the, the time that we said. We might be a little bit late considering that uh, we are a little bit uh, behind today. So, Paul, thank you so much, brother, for all the teaching you've given us. And just the encouragement uh, for all of us. Everyone has been really blessed by it, and uh, we're excited by that. I have some questions here for you, as you can see, quite a bit. Uh, so we'll see from your throw of wisdom here. Do you have any advice for men who work long hours and struggle to balance their life with work, family, and devoting themselves to Christ and learning more about him? Yes, uh, the first thing is, you really need to be in a strong church where the pastor realizes that he is studying vicariously for you. I know that you've probably never heard anything like that, but I believe it is so true. Um, there are so many men, like I, I've grown up and, and lived around, you know, welders and pipe fitters and tool and die guys and farmers and ranchers and everything, and most of them work 12 hours a a day and on Saturdays and and um, so you need to be in a strong church and those of you who are pastors need to realize I'm studying for this man um, the next thing is is uh, do not be in a church where they keep you in church all the time um, there are concentric circles of concern the first one is you care about your soul and your growth in Christ because um, your wife and your children and everyone else needs you to be more Christ-like. So your first thing that you wanna deal with with your limited time is studying the scriptures and prayer for the nurturing of your own soul. The next thing, the next circle is your wife. You don't need to be discipling the world and doing all kinds of other things if you're not taking care of her in discipleship. And that doesn't mean preaching to her an hour a day. It means sitting down with a cup of coffee and, uh, and, and just going through some scriptures together, talking, things like that. And then the next is your children. And then the next is your church. And... Um, you know, when, when COVID hit, all these mission agencies were coming on YouTube and stuff and saying, you know, I know it's economically, it's gonna be tough and everything, but you've got a responsibility to the Great Commission and you need to keep giving to the Great Commission. Well, I got on there and made a completely different video. I said, look, we may be going through some economic times. If you can't give to missions, that's fine. Stop giving. First of all, take care of your family, then take care of your local church and your pastors, if anything's left over and you can give to missions, do that. But if you cannot give to missions for the next couple of years because COVID has you strung out because of employment and everything else, you've not sinned against the Lord. You just look at what you can do. It'll over, it overwhelms me if I look at what I can't do. So, but you, you decide what you can do by what the Lord puts as priorities in your life. Your own godliness, your wife, your children, your church. When you talk vicariously, can you explain that term a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Um, there are a lot of pastors who are just flat out lazy. 
and they get lazy because they have little accountability. And that's a terrible thing. There are other pastors who get really, really busy because not enough emphasis has been placed on training and honoring the ministry of a deacon. A deacon should be taking up a lot of responsibility from a pastor. A pastor's primary obligation is to pray, study the word, and proclaim the word. And so when you go in that, you need to realize that there are housewives who would love to, if I'm talking to pastors right now, you need to realize there are housewives that would love to be able to study the word of God hours a day. There are welders, pipe fitters, cowboys, everything else that would love to be able to spend more time in the word, but they're working themselves half silly just to put food on the table. And so as a pastor, it's your job to study the word and proclaim it and to help men know Christ through your preaching. Amen. How can I be Christ in my home when there is resistance with my wife and how can I lead my wife without lording over her knowing I am a lot further in God than her? Probably <laughs> there's a relationship with her. Well, um, you know, you herd cattle, you lead sheep. Um, the, the, you have a greater opportunity with a difficult wife. You have a greater opportunity to manifest Christ-likeness than you do with a very godly wife. And um, it, it's very easy to act like Christ when your wife is extremely mature and very godly. When you're married to a difficult woman who may not be a believer, that is your great opportunity to show her Christ. And... Um, if she's cut off from you in, in the sense that she doesn't want to hear anything you've got to say about Jesus, then there's a rule I always follow with everybody. If I can't talk to a person about God, then I'll talk to God about that person. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, pray for an open door, pray for an open door. I instead of arguing and fretting and fighting with your wife, you need, to, you need to get before the throne of God and just live a life of prayer on her behalf. Secondly, um, what is it, you know, first of all, you've got to recognize Romans 8, 28, that God is sovereign over your marriage. He could have stopped you from marrying that woman. In fact, the matter, he didn't. Now, what's God doing? Let me share with you something. What is the great goal of God in the life of a man? It's to make him like Christ. Okay, what are the things that we most think about when we think about Jesus Christ? We think about unconditional love, don't we? We think about mercy, we think about grace. Okay, now, how are you gonna learn to exercise unconditional love, mercy, and grace? How are you gonna learn to show unconditional love if you have a wife who meets all your conditions? How are you going to learn how to practice mercy with a wife who never fails you? Do you see, all these things are orchestrated to make you more like Christ. Here's the question. Do you want what Jesus wants? Most men don't. They want a perfect wife instead of wanting to be like Jesus. So if you can recognize that whatever struggles there may be with your wife not wanting to know the Lord or not wanting to follow the Lord or whatever. Whatever struggles you see there, you've got to realize, okay, you've got to ask yourself a question. Do I want the same thing God wants? God has orchestrated this, why? To make me like Christ. Now what would I rather choose, to be like Christ or to have everything I want in a woman? What do I want? And it ought to be, I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. You know, God will give you a mate who is strong in the areas where she must be strong so that you're not tempted beyond what you can bear. But he will also give you a mate in which he's orchestrated her having weaknesses in the very places where you most want her to be strong so that you learn to be like Christ who loves his bride because he is love and because he has determined to love her. So you have an actually a greater opportunity to show Christ likeness 
in, mar- in marriage to a difficult woman. As a, as a woman who has a great opportunity to show Christ-likeness when married to a difficult man. I, I call my, uh, my wife the Holy Spirit Junior. <laughs> in, uh, positively. Yeah. yeah, I could probably get away with that one time. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Brother, my, my wife is Latin. You're not going to get away with that. <laughs> my wife can pull her sandal off her foot, hit every kid in the room, and hit me in the forehead and then catch it. It's like Captain America. Some of you, some of you Latins, you know exactly what I'm talking about. La chancla. <laughs> yeah. I appreciate and receive uh, the strong call to read, study, and devote ourselves to the Word of God. But many say they believe and teach the Bible when they're actually in error, like Jehovah's Witnesses. How can we be sure that we're correctly interpreting the Word as we read? Well, first of all, um, do you have the gospel right? The Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses and these other groups that pretend to study the Bible so much, and they really don't. They study their commentaries on the Bible. But they, we know immediately they're not going to find the truth of Scripture because they're denying the supreme doctrines of who Christ is and what he's done. You know, you cannot go to heaven apart from being one of them, which automatically shows you that that's not right. But here's something that is very important. In hermeneutics, which is the study of how to study the Bible, there are some very important uh, principles. We could go through them, but we don't have time. Uh, Of course, there are principles like context, um, grammar. But there's also the law of non-contradiction. God is perfect. There's no contradiction in his mind. There'll be no contradiction in his word. So if your interpretation of one text contradicts your interpretation of another, either you're wrong in both or wrong in one. But the most neglected principle of hermeneutics I've seen in, the, in America uh, is um, we are always to do our hermeneutic in the context of the church. Now, what does that mean? It means that whenever you and I interpret the scripture, we ought to compare our interpretation to the history of interpretation down through the last 2,000 years. And I'm not talking about Catholicism or its canons or standards. I'm talking about comparing our interpretation with that long history of men and women who believed the Bible was the word of God and supreme standard. If all of them are in agreement with regard to a certain interpretation and you come up with a new one, guess who's probably wrong? So um, there are what I consider centerline historical evangelical reformed commentaries and systematics that are always helpful to use. I am a big proponent of knowing church history and knowing church dogma. I am a, I'm confess, the reason why I'm confessional. And confessional means that um, there were certain confessions in church history that set out the standard of what it means to be Christian like whether Presbyterian, the Westminster, or Baptist, the 1689 London Baptist Confession, the catechisms, and to know that you're in the center of those orthodox documents is always very helpful. Amen. Going back to home here, to our homes, how do you approach evangelism with lost family members? How does the Bible guide us in helping friends, family that struggle through anxiety, depression, or other things. That's probably a different question, but evangelism. Well, so many people, when they get saved, uh, they're in a cage stage. They need to be locked in a cage. Uh, They're obnoxious in their witness. Um, They don't take an attitude of a servant. They don't humble themselves. Um, I think that Colossians chapter 4 Verses two through uh, five, or probably, or six, are the greatest passages on this question. And he says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up a door for the word. Quit trying to knock down the doors of your family members. 
because they're like Jericho. They're tightly shut up and no one goes out and no one comes in. Only the son of David can open up a door that no one can close. You need to spend more time praying for an open door instead of prodding or trying to manipulate or trick someone into talking about Jesus. And he says, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which we have been in prison. He's praying for an open door. And then that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. So you're praying for an open door and you're praying daily that when you get that opportunity, you will speak in a way that you ought to speak. And then conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders making the most of the opportunity. Now it's talking about your conduct. Let me give you an example. So if I sit down on a plane and I'm talking to somebody, uh, just, just talking, and that's the way I start. I just talk to people because I even want to be a servant in the conversation. I don't want to be a bully in the conversation. And I also don't want to use some evangelical gimmick to try to trick them into talking about Jesus. So I talk to them and I'm praying. And sometimes an opportunity arises. And sometimes if I know like the plane's getting close to landing and no opportunity has arisen, then I'm going to do something I learned from John MacArthur. I'm just going to look at them and say, you know, I've had a wonderful conversation. But there's something very important to me that I would like to ask you. Um, Have you ever understood the gospel? And would you give me a few minutes to explain it? Just straight up. And uh, I've had people say, why yes. I remember one time coming back from Romania, actually. I, I get on the, I fly from Bucharest, I think, to Amsterdam. I get on a plane. And I sit beside this really dignified looking man and start talking to him. And um, I said, have you ever understood the gospel? And he goes, uh, you know what? That's a I've been thinking about that lately. I mean, my family was religious, but, but he goes, you know what? We got like five or six hours. Could you just explain to me Christianity? <laughs> and he, he was one of George Bush's aides. So, I mean, God opens up doors. But, but what I, one of the things that I'd like to point out to you is I remember talking to a man and it got towards the end and I said, we had a great conversation. I said, you know, may I share what's so important to me? And he goes, well, what's that? And I said, just have you ever understood the gospel? And I mean, his face changed like stone. He said, no, I don't want to hear anything about your God or anything like that. And he was extremely rude. Now, I could have pushed, right? But when he said that, I said, okay. Now, you were telling me about your son. Um, So how's he doing in college? And we just began talking. And I'll never forget, he got up, you know, the plane landed, and he got up to pull his bags off the thing, and I was getting ready to get up, and he was walking out, and he took like one step, and he turned around and looked at me, and he goes, I just want you to know I'm so sorry for being rude. Now, if I had pushed him, then he would have got off the plane, probably been in a bar with some of his work buddies there in the airport, and all he would have talked about is how some evangelical accosted him. But instead, it was like heaping, you know, hot coals on his head, and maybe it prepared his heart. So I, I, trust in the power of God. You don't have to manipulate or prod. You do have to be available, and you need to try to have opportunities, but you've got to entrust that to God, and that's so much more with your family. You can do so many college students get saved in college and bless their heart, they go home and they're nominal Christian parents and they walk in the door and say, I'm a Christian now and by the way, uh, your Christianity's false. You know, it's like, okay, how's that working for you? It, it's like, don't do that. Don't do that. Hey, this is a question that I think it might surprise you because you haven't spoken much on this. Um, can you speak more on the idea of fleshly, carnal Christian? And is there such a thing as Paul addressing Christians born, Christians born again? I'm joking, of course, that you haven't spoken on this. Cause mm-hmm. Yeah, I think uh, you. The, there, there, is, there is, in all of us, there is this thing called the flesh. 
And it's very hard to define. It's not two natures. It's not two natures. You have one nature. You have a new nature. But there's this residue of, of your fallenness that remains in you, and it fights against the person you really are now. Now, are there Christians who are immature? Yes. Uh, can all of us manifest the flesh? Absolutely. But for someone to profess faith in Christ and go on through their life in a continuous state of immaturity and carnality, um, can I tell them that they are lost? No, but I can tell them they should be very, very afraid and they should check and make their calling and election sure. And I should work with them through the book of 1 John and other places not to convince them that they're lost, but to allow the scripture itself to speak to them. Um, there is a great problem. Believe it or not, we're run, not running into the problem as much as we used to about this uh, easy believism. Why? Back in, even when I was converted in the early 80s, it was still kind of a noble thing to be a Christian. I mean, it was a good thing to go to church. Now it's not. In many places, you're considered a monster, a hypocrite, a, an evil person, a hater of humanity and everything, even in America. So we're having a lot less easy believism, but it's still there. And we need to be very, very careful. Men's souls are precious to God. Should we should not deal with them in a trite manner. And just getting someone to repeat a prayer and then ecclesiastically performing some ritual and telling them they're converted now, welcome to the family of God because you repeated these words, that's extremely, extremely poor evangelism and very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So going talking about uh, the culture we live in and, and just uh, different changes, here's a question. In a Christian culture that pushes progressive Christianity and changing with the times, being relevant, is the church supposed to change its style of preaching to fit the culture around itself, or how should they navigate us? Yeah. This new progressive Christianity is nothing more than old liberalism. <laughs> it's any time there's a departure from Scripture, it's just liberalism in a new form. Um, so here's what you have to understand. Just keep this mantra, for lack of a better word, this, this motto, Christ's church, Christ way. It's his church, it's not yours, it's his. And so everything you do in the church, whether it's preaching, the organization of the church, the pastoring, the counseling, the organization of leadership and everything, it must be done Christ's way because it's his church. Those men who would seek to dress up the church in a different form in order to lure a carnal world back to God are doing something that is terrifying. Let me give you an example. I've used this example in many places. So there's this king. He's just, but he's frightening, powerful. He has a bride, and he loves her more than all his kingdom. And he always dresses her in a plain white gown, very elegant, very beautiful. One day he calls his steward into the throne room, and he says, Steward, I'm going on a long journey, and I want you to care for my bride. Now here is everything. This is, I've written to you exactly what you must do and not do with my bride. So the king goes, and he's gone on this long journey, and the steward begins to recognize, man, the, the people are kind of losing loyalty in the king. You know, the bride is kind of old-fashioned, and they don't appreciate her anymore, and uh, she just seems so backward to them. And so for the sake of saving the kingdom, I need to do something. So he takes the bride, paints her face and dresses her like a whore and parades her in front of a bunch of carnal men in order to attract them back to the king. What's the king going to do when he comes back? He's going to kill that man. Don't be afraid for the atheist on the day of judgment. Be afraid for the evangelical pastors in America who've done the very thing I just said. They have painted the face of Christ's bride. They have taken off her simple gown and dressed her in Hollywood and in entertainment and in Vanity Fair, and they parade her, 
trying to attract lustful men back to the kingdom. When Christ comes back, he will destroy those men. We don't need to be like them. Paul says to Timothy, in case I tarry, I write to you so that one may know how to conduct himself in the household of God. How do you know how to conduct yourself in the household of God? Through what is written. You better not do anything except what is written. And all these goofy things, and it's come out, a lot of it's come out of California. And it's been, you know, so some dude with a, just a great marketing strategy and a great personality and everything else, he builds a mega church and then he writes a book to show everybody else how to do it. It's an abomination. Don't follow it. Just do what the book says. Now, with sermons, I will tell you something. There's this thing about, you know, I'm going to preach an hour. I'm going to preach an hour. Well, some guys shouldn't preach an hour. They should preach about 15 minutes because that's all they have to say. <laughs> and even in my own life, I've looked and, and, and um, I've, been, I've been going around and visiting churches, good churches with good, good pastors. And I think... I would be very careful if I was pastoring one flock that um, I would try to say what I have to say in the shortest amount of time. I wouldn't be moving them around to a different, all kinds of different thoughts. I want the people of God to leave with a couple of primary truths that they've grabbed a hold of rather than this lengthy exposition that's like a commentary and really they don't know where the beginning or the ending is and so I'm really rethinking a lot about about preaching not so much in a conference context because well it's a conference but with just teaching people you know we need to be more like Scotsman you know say it then cut it in half learn how to say it in a more concise, direct manner. And, and w- preaching is not the same as writing a commentary. It's taking that central truth and just driving it home so when they walk out that door, they know what's been nailed into their heart and their head. Great. How do we balance the tension between God cannot be more pleased with us, I assume as children and as children, and our deep need of repentance. Well, here's what we need to see is that our standing, our standing before God is one of fully pardoned and not fully pardoned but made righteous, justified. Now, if there was one sin in your life that wasn't paid for, (laughs) you're in hell. What you need to understand is that he died for your sins, past, present, and future. And his righteousness has been placed in your account. So you're in that context. Now, uh, I love my children. I would die for my children. I mean, I, I, I love them. And even when I've had to, to spank or discipline a child... In the moment of doing that, I would die for them. I love them. In the context of the, whole, the holistic context of my relationship, I am so pleased with them. I am, I am loving them. So God will discipline us. He really will. And that discipline can be like scourging. The book of Hebrews chapter 12, that's not a light spanking. That even to the point of drawing blood but it's never outside of his love. And it's always redemptive and it's always for our good. Amen. So on this idea that that we are dealing with all kinds of sins and all kinds of um, problems, how do we biblically view chronic anxiety Hmm. Is it as simple as keeping in mind Matthew 6, 25, 34? There are actually several questions on this. How do you deal yourself or maybe encourage people who deal with anxiety, depression? Yeah. Probably COVID was... Well, I, I can dangerous. tell you that uh, in my life, uh, probably some of you are familiar with uh, the new Thetic counselor, Jay Adams. He was very, very helpful to me in this sense is that most of our anxiety, most of our fear is not based in reality. 
It's based in what if, or this is coming around the corner. Almost like, um, I think, in, I don't want to take away anything from military men who suffer PTSD. Uh, it's horrific. Battle is horrific. Uh, blood is horrific when it's somewhere other than a video game. It is horrific. Um, but I, I, I see men in, in, in ministry and in different walks of life that I would almost categorize them as PTSD. I mean, just, it's like they are suffering from that traumatic stress syndrome of just constantly burdened, constantly afraid, constantly, if the phone rings, what's the bad news on the other end? And there are several things that we need to do when we're in that situation. First of all, we need to, we need to get help. Anxiety is a killer. Uh, stress is a killer. And we need to have really good pastoral counseling. But we also need, we need a bigger view of God. Now, I don't want to be trite at all. But we need to understand who God is. And we need men who can lead us into a greater understanding of who he is. And the funny story, and I, I, I borrow the line from something I heard years and years ago, but this actually did happen. I was in the Philippines. We are going to this river that was really nasty. You don't want to fall into it, that's for sure. And uh, there were a lot of bad critters in there. And um, so they go, we're going to get in the boat. I said, great, let's go to the boat. We walk down this hill. Where's the boat? He goes, there's the boat. I said, ain't a boat. I mean, I could barely get both my feet in that boat. I said, I'm not going across that river in that boat. And they said, Brother Paul, you need bigger faith. And I said, no, I don't. You need a bigger boat. <laughs> I said, you get a bigger boat, I have bigger faith. <laughs> and that's, you get a bigger God, you'll have a bigger faith. And, and that comes not quickly or tritely, but gradually coming to understand who he is understanding what trials are, and understanding the purpose of suffering. But there's another thing. There's an illustration that uh, I heard many years ago. I think it was from Jay Adams, and I'd like to share it with you about anxiety. So let's say that you guys are a bunch of seminary students, and you're all watching me counsel somebody. So I'm counseling this guy, and we're on the third floor, and uh, there's a big window right here, and there's a door right there, and I'm counseling him. And all of a sudden, he looks to the door and starts screaming like a madman, jumps up and throws himself out the window, falls three stories and breaks both legs and both arms. So I look at you as students, and I go, what's your diagnosis? And you go, man, that guy's crazy. Okay. So we go to the hospital. He's all wrapped up and everything. And you students are watching me talk to him, and I go, okay, buddy, you know, why did you do a dive right out the window? And he goes, well, there was an eight-foot tarantula coming through the door with fangs about this big, dripping poison. I mean, it was coming through the door. It was going to get us. And I look at you as students, and I go, so what's your diagnosis now? And you say, he's crazy. And I said, no, he's not. He's extremely rational. Because the most rational thing you can do if an eight-foot tarantula is coming through the door is jump out a window. Because you stand better chance surviving that fall in three stories than you do with an eight-foot tarantula. I mean, I've been with tarantulas that big and didn't do very well. It's rational if a tarantula is coming through the door. You see, his problem is not so much rationality. His problem is a wrong view of reality. What he's seeing, he's reacting to something in a rational way, but is reacting to something that isn't real. So you have a man who's constantly afraid. He's believing, but he's a constantly afraid that he's a failure and he's going to hell. Well, if you, have a, if you think you're going to hell, it is very rational to be afraid. But maybe he's not understanding Scripture correctly, and he needs a better understanding of reality. He needs a better understanding of trials. He needs a better understanding of the providence of God. He needs to realize that the things that he's fearing, usually 90% of them don't come true. So... There's, there's, there's biblical counseling, but biblical counseling is like the icing on the cake. The, the big thing he needs is a greater understanding of God and Scripture and his relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And he needs friends. 
He needs friends. Guys, um, I am surrounded by godly men. And then I have a bunch of dead ones I run to when I need to in my books. Uh, um, And I think that there's too many people practicing a lone wolf Christianity. A few more questions here for us. Paul, uh, he talked about studying the Bible systematically. Mm -hmm. Any suggested resources for an in-depth systematic study of the Bible? Yeah, um, you need you need to realize something. Boots on, boots off. It's very important, and that applies to Bible study and applies to prayer. And what do I mean? When I study the Bible with boots on, I'm studying the text. I'm trying to figure out what this Greek word means. How does it relate to this preposition? Everything. It will wear you out. It's work. It's hard work. And if that's the only way I study my Bible in time, I'm not going to study my Bible much. So I want to study my Bible with my boots on, but I want to study my Bible with my boots off. That means getting up in the morning, get a wonderful cup of coffee, sit down at the dining room table, open up my Bible, and just read it to enjoy it. And if I come to something I don't understand, I'm not there to, uh, to figure out everything. I'm just there to hear from God and enjoy his word. I marked several things in my Bible from 1 Kings this morning. They were just delightful. I didn't study them in depth. I just read my Bible. So there's, with regard to Scripture, there's two things. One is just reading Scripture and enjoying it. The other is studying Scripture. One of the things that I really recommend that I don't, people scoff at too much or they think it as trite is... Um, I really recommend a good study Bible. Whether it's uh, the MacArthur Study Bible, whether it's Reformation Heritage Study Bible, whether it's the ESV Study Bible. Um, Because I don't recommend reading a chapter and then reading all the chapter notes, but I recommend reading the chapter. And then if you've got some questions, there's probably enough there to help guide you so you can continue reading so that you don't run to your library or something and be looking up every passage and ruin what's really God's doing. Um, Dr. Horner at Masters has a wonderful plan for reading the Bible in which you read 10 chapters a day. It's pretty hefty, but he is an, um, I mean, the people who have followed that reading plan, and you can look at it online or just contact Masters, it's Dr. Horner. Uh, Robert Murray McShane's reading list is another good one. Now, if you've never read through a systematic theology, I recommend that you do that. And, and I don't recommend you do it for an hour a day. Read a few pages and put it aside. Read, a few, read through a systematic theology. Okay? And so they're just small things that you do. Uh, one of the things that people really mess up on in studying their Bible is they'll not be studying their Bible and then they decide that they're real convicted and then they study the Bible the next day for an hour. And that lasts about three days and then they're not studying their Bible anymore. What I recommend, man, if you're not studying your Bible at all, if you're not reading a chapter a day or anything, start with a chapter a day, read it. And just gradually... with devotional life, you're either spiraling up or you're spiraling down. The more you read the Bible and pray, the easier it will become to read your Bible and pray. And the less you do, the more difficult it becomes. And so start off small. Read a a chapter. Start in Matthew. Read a chapter. Just pray, God help me. Even if it's five minutes, that's more than you did the day before. And gradually build yourself up. Find friends in the church to hold you accountable. Go to your pastors and say, look, I, I, I want, I'm struggling in this area. I really need help. So. A couple more. What piece of advice would you give to a man who has a desire to go to seminary or pursue ministry? If you haven't read through scripture several times, don't think about going to seminary. Exhaust um, the resources you have. Now, Um, seminary, there are a lot of bad seminaries. That's all there is to it. It's a waste of time. Do more damage than good. There are some good seminaries. And there are seminaries that um, they honor God's word. 
Master Seminary, Puritan Seminary, a few of the smaller uh, Reformed Baptist seminaries, um, because they honor God's word. But re- remember this, a seminary cannot prepare you. A seminary is designed to give you the tools so that you can spend the rest of your life preparing. If you're going to seminary to learn youth ministry, just don't go to seminary. Read a book about marketing or something instead. (laughs) You go to seminary to learn the languages. Yes, if you want to be a missionary, whatever you want to be. You go to seminary to learn the languages. You go to seminary to learn a proper hermeneutic, how to study the Bible. You go to seminary to learn systematic theology, to learn how to think about the whole picture in a non-contradictory manner. You go to seminary to study church history so that hopefully you don't repeat the same mistakes. But seminary can only do that. Without a local church, you're never gonna grow and be what you're supposed to be. Okay, I think we have time for one more here. Which Bible book or passage that you have memorized has most ministered to you? Which book and passage do you wish you would have memorized? When I had my heart attack and my brain, um, there was a lot of of damage. And um, so my heart stopped three different times for a very lengthy period of time. And uh, when I woke up, I really wasn't the same person Um, memorization is very, very difficult for me now. Remembering things. I lost huge blocks of my life even that I can't remember. And so I I struggle in that area now. Um, But, you know, weakness never hurt a man of God, just strength. So I praise God for my weaknesses. Um, My favorite passage... uh, You know, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above him stood the seraphim, each one having six wings. With two they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they did fly. One cried unto another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him who cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's my, one of my favorite passages because according to John 12, Isaiah saw Jesus. He saw the sun setting on that throne. And I, I love that passage. Um, scripture memory, there's a, a preacher, one of the greatest, named David Miller. And uh, some of you know him maybe. And uh, I remember the first time I heard him preach, he said, now... I'm going to be preaching from Acts chapter 2. And so I was looking down Acts chapter 2, and I just happened to look up about halfway through the reading, and I realized he's just looking at everybody. He, had memori- he, memori- he just memorized all Acts chapter 2. He's in the just, wheelchair also. Yeah, just huge. Por- I mean, maybe all of Scripture. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's unbelievable. So... He's he, quadriplegic sits yeah. in this chair and only can move his And head. even as a quadriplegic, he's more man than just about anybody I've ever met. <laughs> and uh, so I was out at his hunting camp. He has a hunting camp I didn't know that. in Mississippi. I think it's Mississippi. It was hot. And uh, <laughs> so um, I was chopping wood for him. I was splitting wood for him. And he's there in a wheelchair, and I'm just chopping away at some old naughty piece of nastiness. And, uh, and I said, you know, Brother David, I said, uh, man, God has really given you a gift of memorization. He said, no, Brother Paul, he ain't giving me no gift. I just work at it harder than you do. <laughs> That's true. And, and it, I asked him, I said, how do you memorize scripture? He said, well, let me give you an example. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. So I start off with, duh. (laughs) Duh. Duh. Okay, I got that part. The Lord. The Lord. 
the Lord, the Lord is. He is. The Lord is. And he just, that's the way he does it. He goes one word at a time. <laughs> Praise God. That's encouraging and at the same time depressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's this little girl that calls our office at Heart Cry and everyone's, she's memorized entire books of the Bible. Wow. Just a little teenage girl or whatever, just entire books. Amazing. All the book of Romans, just everything. Yeah, you, you feeling lost? <laughs> wow. Brother, thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, thank the Lord for our Amen. brother Paul. And uh, let's, uh, let's pray for him. Tomorrow he's going to be preaching here at Trinity three times. So uh, the Lord might give him, needs to have a lot of grace over this brother. He has to rest well. So let's pray over him. So wherever you are, would you mind stretching your hand over our brother? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our brother Paul. Thank you, Lord, for the gift he's been to us this weekend already. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the ways in which you have blessed him and blessed so many throughout the world through him. Continue, Lord, to keep your hands of protection, of guidance, of care over him, over his family. I pray, Lord, that you'll keep him away from the temptation of pride. I pray, Lord, that you'll help him to stay away from evil, from evil situations. Continue, Lord, to use him, not only here, but throughout the world. Give him strength, give him stamina, give him energy. Again, thank you, Lord, for the gift he is to us. And Lord, we pray that as he continues to um, minister to us here and in other parts of the world, we pray that Jesus will be exalted more than anything else. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's thankful men said, amen, amen. amen. Thanks, brother.